Welcome to the Andy Darer Show. This is episode 31. This week my guest is Aaron Burkhardt, drummer of Screaming Sons of, and also the first Nirvana drummer. We take a look inside of the Seattle sound of the late 80s, and we see just how much it's changed since then. Thanks again for listening. Thank you so much for uh, tuning into the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 31, and today my guest via phone is Aaron Burkhard. How you doing, Aaron? Good. How are you, Andy? I'm doing great. Yeah, this is the original, the first drummer for Nirvana, and um, he's also in the band Screaming Sons of currently. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Awesome. And also, also on, on uh, uh, one track from Nerd Table that's going to be coming out in a couple months. Oh, really cool. Yeah, I've been checking out the demos of uh, Screaming Sons of, and it's definitely that raw sound that definitely brings back, you know, the whole uh, Seattle sound a little bit while getting even heavier, it seems. Am I correct? Right, right. Yeah, I've always been heavy, you know. I always <laughs> like to play heavy shit. Yeah, you can't get that out of your blood, right? Uh-uh, no. Yes, <laughs> you can. So I heard you just had your birthday, and my birthday was actually last week as well. It's uh, I guess we're both Scorpios here. How was uh, the festivities? Oh, good, good, good. I went to a show up in uh, Seattle uh, at the High Line, and it was and Cad was there. It was kind of good to hang out with him. And buddy, my buddy uh, Dave Foster, who also was in Nirvana, his band played Miko Donace. And yeah, it was a pretty good show. Got hammered. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Why not? It's your birthday. And. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, so you're playing. You're still playing the drums in these bands, and are you going to have any shows with Screaming Sons of coming up? Or? Yeah, we're playing uh, uh, December 17th at the Mix, which is uh, in Georgetown, which is in like South Seattle, and then we're doing a New Year's Eve show. I think down in Elma, kind of close to Aberdeen. Oh, I got you. Cool. Yeah, and uh, I actually just recently made a, a pilgrimage to Mecca, as I like to call it. I, got, I went to Aberdeen for the first time just to. Uh, you know, go see the memorial under the bridge and uh, just yeah. like re- reconnect with the whole scene. It all, you know, it's been almost twenty or twenty years since Nevermind, and I just, I just had to do it for myself. You know. Right on, cool. Yeah, I, I kind of grew up in Aberdeen, but uh. So it, you're, yeah. you're used to it pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm not far away from there now as it is. I'm in Olympia, so that's just fifty miles. So. It's, cool, and I. I think- Far enough. <laughs> Wait, okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, I heard you guys did a demo at Robert uh, Lang's studio. Uh, he's the guy for, who uh, produced like Def Leppard and stuff, right? Or... Oh yeah, yeah. He did. A, he did like he did the Foo Fighters. He did REM. He did Candlebox's albums. And uh, yeah, he's he's a uh, he's a really cool guy. Plus, I guess that never mind or Nirvana did uh, the the you know you're right there. Oh, I didn't even know. Out. Huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And he also did the box set. He also did all the remastering in the box set was done there also. Oh, shit. Didn't even know that, huh? And he was married to Shania Twain. Am I correct? No. You're thinking of, uh, you're thinking of Mutt Lang. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's not the same Mutt Lang? No, 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 no. no. I, I thought the same thing, too, when I first met him, or first heard him. Yeah, no, no. It's a whole different, it's a whole different Lang thing. That is funny, because I believe it is Robert Mutt Lang. So I was totally not, not yeah, out of the bounds. It, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, you're not too far. I, I I thought the same thing, dude. I thought I did. I swear to God, I thought the same thing. That's awesome. How uh, how nice of a studio is it? Oh, it's beautiful, man. It's like on the side of a hill, and it's just it's like Spanish style. It's like five stories high, and it's just he took us on a tour. It's just amazing, amazing recording studio. Plus house, you know. It's like yeah, really oh, nice. He so he's living there. It's like a compound, huh? Yeah, yeah. He's also building one down in Mexico, I think, another recording studio slash house type thing down there. But yeah, really, really posh place. Like, like, I like it. Cool. Um, yeah. So you're living in Olympia now. Um, what, what kind of stuff do you do for fun? Like, what clubs do you go to, or or do you go well, to clubs? I go, yeah, I used to go hang out in Seattle. We've been playing a lot of shows up in Seattle. So, like El Corazon and well, Hell, Tacoma Hell's Kitchen. I I go to a lot of shows there. They got they got pretty cool shows there, but uh, n- not many clubs here in Olympia now. You, get, you, you got the Fourth Ave Cab, that's about it, and McCoy's. Oh. McCoy's is a cool rock place. Cool, yeah. I'd like to take it back a little bit, um, as far as your history. And uh, so you grew up in Aberdeen, am I correct? Yeah, I grew up uh, back and forth from West Seattle to Aberdeen. 
I did all my like uh, junior high, grade school, junior high, and high school years in West Seattle, and then I moved to Aberdeen when I was like 16, 17 years old. Like, how how was your yeah. family situation at the time? Were, were your parents together when you were like as a teenager? Oh, yeah. No, I had I had a pretty much dysfunctional. I had a, a mom and a stepdad, and pretty much, uh, yeah. I, I didn't want to get into that. That was that was a uh, no, not not very much uh, happy, happy, joy, joy <laughs> when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? I got you. So did music help you out? Like, uh, you know, help you get out of that? You know, those problems? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I I I we were there's five of us in the family, five of us kids, and there's no way I could have a drum set. So it's like as soon as I got in seventh grade, I started taking drums and. Learned the bass and the snare drum, and and I was in bands ever since then. You know, I don't know, just I just had a gift. I thought maybe I I knew how to play them. You know, how, how, I got a good question. How about like an early drumming inspiration for you? Was it like John Bonham, or are we talking about oh, more metal dude, stuff? All, it was Neil Peart all the way, dude. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Neil Peart and John Bonham, but Neil Peart was up there. You know, I always just loved his drumming. Yeah, I was just talking to somebody. I, I think that there needs to be a band that like captures that same weirdness that that the band R- Rush had. You know, there's no band in 2011 that's really like you know a trio that really just are virtuos on each instrument. You know, right? Yeah, yeah, total virtuosos on the instruments. And they also capture that you know alienation type. You know, uh, being a teenager and you know kind of hating your life and not knowing what's next. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, how about your first bands, or, uh, like, uh, what was your first uh, band that you had? Well, the first band was, uh, was I moved, which kind of ties in with the old Nirvana thing, I moved into a friend of mine, Dana Bong, in, like, I was 19, it was, like, in 81, 82. I moved in with him and his girlfriend in this alley, and we started a band called Soon. It was, like, just S-O-O-N, Soon. But Dale Crover from the Melvins sure. lived across the alley from me, right? Oh, okay. So and this is this is a few years before Dale even joined the Melvins. He was in a band called Rampage. Which was like a cover band they played like high schools and various so I, I became good friends with Dale. You know, sure. and then and then then when he joined the Melvins, oh my God, it was like and I lived right across the alley so I was at every freaking practice, you know what I'm saying? You couldn't get enough of the Melvins, but uh, Yeah, they were calling you Klingons, right? Or yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Because I, I was, a, I mean, usually every practice. I mean, what kind of guy cool. is Crover? Is he a uh, is he a nice guy to be around, or did it take a while for oh, yeah, you yeah. guys to be friends? No, yeah, he's fun. He's funny. He's funny. He's a cool guy. He, you know, and to see how big he is now with the Melvins, you know, because they're just like huge underground wise, you know. Oh yeah, but, yeah, Dale, yeah, Dale's, Dale's my buddy. That's awesome. So, yeah, being the Klingon, is that where you kind of, like, fell in line with Kurt? Was he at the same practices? Or? Yeah, well, he, him and Chris he, he used to come over and hang out sometimes and practice. And I don't know, one day at, we was a, I was up there watching practice, and uh, Kurt and Chris were there, and they asked me to join. That's they awesome. Said, you want to be our drummer? And I was like, fuck yeah, all right. So, I mean, and, and it was the very next, we went and got drums that same day. And that very same night, we were at Kurt's house, set up in his living room practicing. That is so cool, huh? And they had already yeah. done like a tape as fecal matter. Or? Yeah, yeah, but that was it. Was nothing, you know? It was. I don't think Chris was on fecal matter. I'm pretty sure he wasn't. But uh, yeah, but Kurt was already, you know, in the works, you know, writing music and shit. So. Uh, yeah. Could you tell at the time that he was going to be a powerful songwriter, or was it just another dude that you're jamming with? Just, it's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look back now, but it's just another dude that I was jamming with, you know? But Kurt had, he had, I, I think he had a different kind of vision, different focus, you know? Because I, I was jamming with somebody, and I was, you know, I had only been in bands for a couple of years then. So, but yeah, you know, what we were all, there was like all, we were in a small town, and it was all, we were in all the same cliques, you know, all the musicians hung out together. And sure. So. How about, how about like the bridge thing? Was, is that, is there any truth to that? He actually uh, stayed the night under, under that young street I, bridge? I don't No, He never, we used to go there and get stoned. That's where we go smoke weed, you know? And <laughs> sure. We drink, yeah. <laughs> we called it drinking uh, fish beer and cause we drink animal beer, you know, cause it, it just, it was cheap. Right. And sure. Plus it was, it was on the way to Chris's house. Because Chris, you have to cross that bridge 
to go up to Jimmy Hill. Oh, okay. Right. So, and that's where Chris is. So we we sometimes we just walk up to Chris's house, you know, three of us, and but we'd have to go over that bridge, and we'd stop at the bridge, and that that was when it was all run down, and you know, and it was like a little bat trail to get down there. Now it's all open and the park and shit. So it's kind of weird. That's funny. Yeah, it was the perfect memorial because, you know, I didn't want to go to like a stuffy old museum and see, you know, old pictures. This was like you kind of felt his presence a little bit. You see all that fan art and stuff. And like I even found a hunting knife and I said, okay, that'll be my little souvenir. Put it in my pocket, you know, so. Right on. Cool. (laughs) Yes, yeah, it's what a memorial should be, and uh, yes, yeah, so you guys would just you know hang out there, you know, be derelicts underneath the bridge, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds like awesome times. And uh, so, what you Kurt never lived there. Kurt, Kurt his he, his mom lived like a two blocks from the bridge. So yeah, I got a picture of that you... house, and I was like, man, there's got to be something else because that house looks like every house in my neighborhood in Chicago, you know. So I was like, yeah. and that didn't quite like you know make my day so i needed something a little bit more so i'm glad i found the memor- or the young street bridge thing cool but wow. yeah we did the same thing you know just hanging out trying to waste the day away you know and uh so what kind of like uh early demos were you guys fleshing out at these practices are is it like a lot of the bleach material am i correct that that in uh insecticide like the b side of insecticide like anorexis and and Mexican seafood, and if you, you know, just the old songs. Sure. Like Arrow Zeppelin and Downer, Floyd the Barber, you know, then we're, you know. And I'll never forget, uh, we did it like our first little demo cassette, and Kurt named it, this is a true story, too. Kurt named it, A is for Aaron, who fell down the stairs and shit his dress, <laughs> right? And, he, and Kurt drew a picture, because he's only drawn, he drew a picture of the, some little stairs, with a little stick girl in a dress <laughs> falling down, right? <laughs> and that was that was our demo. But, that uh, is yeah. so cool, huh? <laughs> and there's another story. We played. Uh, we, our first game was Skid Row, and yeah. we played live. We played live on the radio station in Olympia at Chaos. It was like it, it's a radio station called Chaos, and it was a midnight show. Well, the very next day, and Kurt had been talking about changing our name from Skid Row. Because she found out about another band called Skid Row, right? Yeah, Sebastian Bacher. The other metal band, right? So, uh, and I swear to God, the very next day, I showed up to Kurtz to unload the gear because we hadn't unloaded from the night before. And he was drawing a picture. He had an easel, right? Okay. A big painting. And he drew a picture of its of a freaking pen. Sure. With its cap all chewed up, right? Yeah. And that day, from that that next day after that chaos show, we were uh, pen cap chew. Pen cap right? chew. That is so yeah. awesome. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we we actually that. used to jam around when we were when we were in you know ju- uh, junior high and stuff. And I had just read "Come as You Are" by Michael Azarad, and uh, yeah. we uh, did a show or two as Pen Cap Jew, and nobody else you know knew about you know knew about the band, <laughs> knew that we were plagiarizing Mr. Kurt. But uh, yeah, right. people like the name though. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a pretty cool book. I, that, that's you know out of all the books. You know that I've read or seen. It's that's the only one that's really true. Really, you know, because Kurt was that's the only one that was written when Kurt was alive. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And and I wouldn't. And that Michael Azarad he got so pissed off at me, dude. He's like, because uh, I wouldn't sign the uh, release forms for my sure. interview. Okay. And uh, and he, and I told him, I well, I need, I want to get an okay from Kurt, so that he okays my interview for some reason. You know, what I'm saying? so and that's the last time Kurt called me was in. Uh, it was November of '93, and he was telling me to sign them papers. <laughs> so, I guess Mike Lazarad wouldn't leave him alone or something like that. Gotcha. So Kurt gave you the go ahead to do the interview. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple, no, Mike Lazarad came to Aberdeen and interviewed me with the tape recorder and everything. Sure. You're right. So he, I wanted Kurt to listen to my interview that he did and okay it, basically. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so you're being like a nice guy and just making sure it's yeah. all, it's all good uh-huh. for him. Huh. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you if, if how true uh, the parts about you are in the book. Like, I heard you got in a couple like crazy accidents during during your time with yeah, Nirvana. Yeah. No, this is before I was in Nirvana. Oh. I got in a bad car wreck in '84 out on uh, the highway leaving Aberdeen, and I hit that uh, going through Central Park there, and we hit the cement barrier, and it killed the driver, a good friend of mine. I was in the passenger seat, so yeah. Plus, plus, I also drove through the front of fucking uh. The shop right where Kurt used to live, where we used to practice, was behind the this, shop yeah. right. And we went to the front of a store. Like, I wasn't driving. I was passenger, and this chick hit the, 
I was with this chick, and she hit the uh, gas instead of the brake, and we drove right through the front of the oh, grocery shit. store. Right, I took out the whole video section, and oh yeah, it was crazy. That is hilarious. Did you ever get like to see the police footage or, or like the video footage, or was there uh, any like? No, no, no. I I took off. The chick's like, I get out of the car, and she's like, get back in. I was like, fuck that. No way. She took off, and yeah, and I I kind of went around the building, and I got away, but they weren't after me because I wasn't driving. Oh, I got you. They're just after her. Yeah. <laughs> Did she get in a lot of trouble? Or? Oh yeah, she had, it was like twenty five thousand dollars worth of damage. Oh and man. <laughs> just yeah, they took out the whole front of the store. That's crazy. So, like, what kind of guy was Chris Novosel? Like, um, was he more of the Joker guy or like the like the <laughs> yeah. out loud guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Chris. He's just. He had his van. I remember in high school he had this van and he and he painted uh, like a safari, you know, black and white stripes. Sure. But he, yeah, Chris was always he's a crazy one. He's fucking hilarious. Their whole family is. I'm good friends with his little brother Robert also, and then there's they're, they're all tall. They're all tall. Yeah. Crazy, you know? <laughs> but yeah, Chris Chris is the funny. He's the funny one out of a bunch. I tell you. That's awesome. Do you guys ever uh, correspond? No, I saw him uh, about, I saw him last September. No, just a couple months ago, I saw him at the, um, the Nevermind show. They had the EMP. Oh, sure. With the, the 20th anniversary thing. Awesome. But, you know, we, talk, we don't correspond. I talk, say hi, and that's about it, you know. Give him a big hug, and that was, you know. Like, how about this? Do you do you ever uh, get together with the old? I know this kind of sounds corny, like the like a plot for a bad reality show. But do you get do the old uh, like drummers of Nirvana ever uh, get together? You know, you know Chad Channing, Dave Foster, Dan Peters, you and Crover. Well, I I talk to Dave a lot because Dave plays drums for a band that I was in a few years ago, and that's who I went and saw the other night on my birthday. Sure. With Nico, they're called Nico Dinate. But Dave Foster plays drums for them, and uh, I don't know. I, I've met Dan and Dan Peters a couple times, but I'm more I'm I'm good friends with uh, Matt Lucan. Lucan's oh, okay. my buddy. Cool. Yeah, Matt. I've seen him the last few months. I've seen him a couple times, and because uh, we do shows up in West Seattle, and he, he lives right by the venue where we play. <laughs> so he, he comes he out. Kind of been, yeah, Matt's Matt's a good guy. Did you ever uh, he, run into he, Dave Grohl? No, I've never met Dave. Never met him. Oh. Huh. He's not really the nope. Seattle part uh Seattle guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. But he did live up by Robert Lang Studios for a while. Oh yeah, you said they recorded there, huh? Yeah, when Dave Grohl first his first recordings of Foo Fighters was done at uh, Robert Lang Studios. <laughs> oh that does ring a bell now, yeah. The first the solo or the self titled album. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. That's cool. The first one we did where where you know, they did all the instruments and yeah, that's the best yeah, one for me. Good. I don't know about anybody else, but oh yeah, the, with the futos or the, the like the mentos with the, the futos and yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> How about this? I heard I saw you post that uh, like a lot of the ideas for the drumming of Bleach were were up to you, kind of like it was all like the next generation, yeah. and then like the uh-huh. Nevermind album was a lot of Chad Channing's to do as uh-huh. far as drumming, and then uh, In Utero was where was when Grohl finally put his mark on it. Yeah, yeah, that's where I look at it, you know, and it. It is true, I mean, because uh, I, I don't know, there's a lot of songs, like like I said, a lot of Bleach and a lot of, the whole B-side of, of uh, Incesticide with me, but I, I was in the band when the songs were written, but I know it's just, you know, sure. I didn't record it, so I kind of got robbed, but, but I you know, the same thing happened to Chad with uh, Nevermind. With Nevermind, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause Chad was like, for instance, In Bloom, that's Chad, so I can... Yeah, there's there's a lot of songs that I don't know how that works with you know drummers are just fucking drummers, but uh, this new recording that I'm not coming out on it's uh, Nerd Table. Okay. And I'm doing a. It was basically done online. The recording. Well, I went in Cat's studio and he he recorded my drums, but it's got Dale Clover. It's cool because we're doing Floyd the Barber, and uh, Dale Clover's singing uh, the chorus and I'm playing the drums. I heard this. It's so, awesome, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that's uh. So you get you guys are. Uh, I heard about this, and uh, so you guys are doing this just as a one-off single, or is it going to be for some sort of compilation? Or? I, I think it might be on a compilation also, but it, right now it's it's going to be on their table's next album, which it, it's supposed to be out in March, called Chasing the Bronco. And is that which, is, uh, is that Dale Crover's band or? 
no, no, no. That they're called Nerd Table, but they're also friends with Toshi, who does a lot of uh, the Melvins, and he does a lot of uh, Jeff sure. Nephews, which is uh, Dale's uh, other band, Jeff Nephews, and uh, yeah, he just produces a lot of music, and uh, they're just friends. And the artwork for uh, for Chasing the Bronco. This is a w- really weird picture of a monster. That was done by a by a Chris Kirkwood from oh, sure. Me Puppet. So yeah, but at Nerd Table, all this it's got all the special. It, Ron Jeremy's on it. <laughs> Dave Foster's on it, and yeah, it's just a it's a hilarious. It's that cool. sounds like I'll, a really interesting thing. I'll have to definitely check that out. You're saying next year coming out? Oh, uh, March. Okay. I got an advanced copy already, and I it's just it's just a killer album. Oh, but, that's uh, yeah, awesome. it's supposed to be out it's supposed to be out in March. Yeah, bring up the Meat Puppets. I just actually caught them at the Double Door in Chicago last week, and man, these guys still throw down a crazy show. I mean, right the, yeah, I think the guy's I think about fifty years old, and he's just blowing minds. I mean, they played all their songs just really electrified and louder than they than they are in the studio. So it was a crazy show. Right on. And they're actually cool. uh, yeah, they okayed an interview, so I might be doing an interview with them in December. Uh, cross your fingers, but. Right on. Yeah, I I I love Meat Puppets. Yeah, were they uh were they as big as an inform or as an inspiration on you guys starting out or was that something that Kurt had yeah, in Kurt, his pocket? Kurt, Kurt loved the meat puppets back when I was in the band. Yeah, I remember he had little flyers on his wall, meat puppets. Yeah, he liked the meat puppets forever. Yeah, the Meat Puppets 2 album is classic, but I just got into some of the other albums that people don't even talk about around that time, you know, 87, like Huevos and Mirage, right. and they're they're pretty crazy because they kind of put away the country and they actually use a little bit of drum machines and stuff like that, so it's just a really weird-sounding Meat Puppets album, you know? Right so what kind of music are you are you into lately of, of, of like, the newer generation? The newer generation? I don't know. I just... I I'm old school like like I love Metallica and sure. Exodus and I'm just I've always been a metalhead you know I I like all types of music basically yeah is it, is it true right that the now, metal is kind of like lame nowadays with this new metal I I kind of can't even yeah. listen to a lot of new metal right I went and saw Corn I I always like Corn and they kind of disappointed me and I don't know it's just they're kind of they aged quickly like they were so vital when their first couple albums you know totally different sound and now it seems like they fired a lot of guys and now it's just that singer and maybe one of the other guys and I don't know it seems like they're kind of faking the faking the metal yeah. now yeah dude because they were jamming on stage I saw them at the, at the White River uh, this summer and uh, they had a hidden guitar player right so he's, really? out, he's out behind the drummer you know you can see him jamming but he's kind of hidden. And he's getting down, right? But he's not. He's not in the band. Corn. It's like, and you know. No, they. <laughs> well, it's kind of kind of lip syncing with the with the. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. I, I always think it's lame when a band will bring out that other guitarist and put them like behind a curtain or something. Like Green Day does that. Yeah, now. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how. That's what Corn is doing. But I've been listening like, to like uh, Brothers of the Sonic Cloth, right? That's a uh, sure. Chad's new band. And then uh, I, I just went and saw uh, Vaporland, which is a. Uh, Kurt Danielson, members of Kurt Danielson and Love Battery and oh, The okay. Fluid, right? And which Kurt was from Chad also. Sure. And then, yeah, and then I went and saw, uh, there's a band like Lozen. I go to a lot of like, a lot of punk rock shows. Band Lozen and see who else I want to listen to. That's awesome. So like the Seattle scene is still going. It's just, uh, you know, it's just finding itself in different bands, like newer incarnations yeah. of old band, of old guys that have been around. Exactly, dude. And, we, and then Malfunction's back, right? With, with Malfunction, which is Kevin Woods. Andy yeah, obviously Woods, without Andy Kevin. Wood, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, there's a lot of them, like like you said, incarnation of bands. But there's a lot of killer show. I mean, every every other day there's a, every week there's a killer show up in Seattle. I just rediscovered that malfunction. Like I just found the album at a used CD store, and it's it's really really damn good. And I, yeah, Jack and Dino produced it. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Jack and Dino, he plays in uh, the Biz Queen, or he's he's kind of a guest guitar player. Sure. In the Biz Queens, and they played last night here in Seattle at the Paramount. Huh. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's just reincarnating itself into different groups, and that's awesome. How about uh, the guys? How about the guys from Soundgarden? Do you ever see them around? I met Kim uh, just last April, but he goes to a lot of uh, like Cat or Brothers of the Santa Claus shows and Nico Dinacci shows, and 
But yeah, they they hang out in clubs. You'll see them every once in a while. You go to a show, you'll see Kim you know, hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of it's kind of strange. Like the other night, I went to the show, uh, Dave Foster's band, Nico Dinaccia, and uh, Cab was there. I was like, right on. So I'm kind <laughs> awesome. of awesome. <laughs> yeah. Is he still as huge as he's always been? No, he's lost a lot of weight, dude. Really? Huh. He's, he's, yeah, he has. He's, his uh, his wife Peg, they call her Peg Death. Okay. She's cool. <laughs> I, I think she like cracked a whip and. I got you. you know. <laughs> but I was all drunk and I was hanging at Tad's table, right? The other night, and I'm like, Tad, I got a million dollar winner. We, we, we're gonna, because these they're called Brothers of the Sonic Claw. Okay. Sure. New band. I said, we're gonna re, we're gonna regroup this cat again. <laughs> we're gonna get you out there, you know, because I can imagine if he if he went and toured as Cad, you know, he'd probably get a hell of a more. I don't know. I don't know if he kind of took yeah. that as a. I, you know I think I mean? if, if he went with the Tad name, I think he'd draw more tickets. So sales. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, like it's weird about the Seattle scene. How about Pearl Jam? Were they? Uh, actually truly part of the scene or was it more of just a little bit of yeah, an yeah. acting job? Yeah. No, I did a show. She pulled down with Green River, then Mother Love Bone, then Pearl Jam. Yeah. Basically. And I, I like the malfunction thing. When I, we were called up, I think we were Ted Ed Pred. It might have been Skid Row. But we did a show with, with Malfunction, with Andrew Wood. Oh, that's awesome. And Malfunction and Red Cross up in uh, Tacoma. But uh, yeah, because like, Skin Yard, you know? Yeah, of like course. Jack and Dino's old band. Skin and, and the Mud Honey and the... It's all... They're all intertwined, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like a long lineage of bands and ancestry, mm-hmm. kind of. How about Eddie Vedder, though? Good. Eddie Vedder was kind of an outsider of the Seattle scene, am I correct? Yeah, he was like from Southern California or something. Yeah, he was... But see, when Andrew died, right? Yeah. It, that's basically... Pro Jam was Mud Love Bone. Then Andrew died, and they got Eddie better, basically, except a different drummer also. Well, you know, shit like that, you know, they just, bands grow out of other bands. It's kind of weird. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad Nirvana didn't try to do that with, or, I mean, they could have with another singer, but it just wouldn't have held the, you know, the same legendary right. status. You know? Yeah, you could, there's no way you could replace Kurt, you know. N- there's no way in the world, yeah. Yeah. How about like what what's next for the Screaming Sons of are you gonna go in and do a full album at, at the same studio yeah, or we're going down to Reno in April, we're doing a little tour. So we're gonna tour down there. Because my my guitar player and singer in my band, Screaming Sons of, is also the bass player for a well known band around here called Gebular. Yeah, I read about that. That's cool. Yeah, and so it's like uh, we're gonna do a tour with them and he's just gonna do uh, perform double duties. We That's already cool. got the show booked in Reno, but we're going to book more shows on the way down. Instead of just going all the way down there and playing one show, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, work your way down slowly, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually did an interview with Steve Albini this early this year, and uh, would you guys ever think, I, I thought your sound would be really neat with having him record it. Um, would that ever be a, an idea? Oh, yeah. Cause, I don't know. I don't know. I've never worked with him, but... Uh, that'd be a dream to have him do our sound, you know what I'm saying? Like, the way he captures drums, like the Jesus Lizard albums and stuff like that, right. I just, I could just hear you just sounding like a monster with, with Steve Albini recording. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and plus, he's not that expensive, actually. People don't realize that. No, he, yeah, they don't realize that he charges like a flat fee. They don't get like points and percentages off albums. They get a, you know, a flat fee. Yeah. yeah, he's not taking but, any but, points. He's punk rock, pretty much. Yeah. But it's something I mean, you got to go back to, like, the internet kind of just, it's a bittersweet thing. It's like, because there's no really labels anymore. Everybody just starts their own band and they start their own label. Sure. I don't know, you know, it just it doesn't seem like, like, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that labels were out looking for bands. Now they don't have to, you know, it's like everything's just so. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Band. Like, how, how, how it's got to have changed a ton as far as even when, uh, like, early 90s to now, about how. The labels oh, don't yeah. matter at all, you know? Labels don't matter. It's like everybody's uh, everybody's in a band now. And I don't know. I'm trying to figure out, well, was everybody in a band 20 years ago also? Or is it just that that every the Internet and Facebook has got everybody so connected now? It just seems like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe it just everybody's seems always, like everybody, like there's more bands now because now you, get, yeah. you have to hear about them all. So. Uh-huh, exactly. Now, I, I can't figure out if it was, was it like this. 
you know, or maybe it was Kurt who decided, well, everybody just wanted to fucking, everybody can be in a band because everybody's not as good as a guitar player as Hit Tink, right? Yeah, like, that's true. Know, like Kurt, maybe the- Kurt wasn't that good of a guitar player. He was kind of musically retarded, but he was that, you know, he had the passion and stuff, you know, and, yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, do you think you think we're better off at this year, or do you think uh, compared to 1987, are we better off, or are we oh, worse no, off? Oh no, we're fucked, dude. We're fucked. We're fucked all around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, I, I I just you know I'm almost 50 now myself. You know, sure. and, and I went to a, I went to a book signing on just Tuesday. That uh, that um uh, what's his name uh, Mark Yarm. Okay. Mark Yarm wrote that book, The Oral History of Grunge. Yeah. Well, I went to I went to his book signing thing, and uh, you know, it's just it's just it's all about everybody's about you know. I, I just hate people that you know they write about shit and they don't know about it, you know. And yeah, I don't know. Wait, was, but, he, was my, did you not like that book? Or? I haven't read it. Yeah, so. but <laughs> but he, he called me to want to interview me. And I thought he was just some kind of goop freak because his name was Mark Yarm, which is so close to Mark Arm. So I, I just kind of this was months ago, and, and he Facebooked me and wanted to interview me. And I was like, uh, well, I don't know because since I've been Facebook, you know, everyone wants to interview me, and I don't do that many interviews, right? Yeah, yeah. I check you out and said too, right? And you're like authentic, right? So, but anyway, so I I'm like, it, yeah. so I, I kind of shrugged it off. And it turns out his book was huge or something, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, so I was kind of I met him and stuff and you know but he, he never interviewed me. Yeah, I, I I had a friend read it and said it wasn't all that it was stacked up to be. So I don't think you made a bad decision, you know. <laughs> and then yeah, and then there's the authors that write shit about me like this one dude, Jeff Burlingame is his name. He he wrote a book and uh, I checked it out. It just pissed me off. I was like, I you know I'm on like seven pages and he got the story wrong. I don't know. They write about me and shit, but get the story straight, you know. Yeah, at but least that, ask you, you know. Yeah, sorry, this kind of pissed me off because the guy didn't even talk to me, and I'm on seven pages of his book, and he's writing a story that got all the fucking thing wrong, and so yeah, it's just I don't know. Yeah, no, that's tough, Everybody, man. What are you gonna do? Sue him? You can't. You don't really want to put yeah, all your effort into yeah. doing that. You can just, you know, smack talk a little bit, you know. Right. Exactly. And that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah, just go on Facebook yeah, and say, so, don't read this book, and people will probably, you know, like, it'll, you could, you know, cause a little havoc that way or something. Right. Yeah. That's awesome, wow. though. And I, I really do appreciate you, uh, you know, checking me out, making sure I'm authentic, and I, I appreciate you even uh, taking the time out of your day to do this interview. So. Right on. Yeah, he, I, you know, and I don't, I don't usually, I don't do that many interviews. I mean, really, there's not that many people really out there. They are, but they're... You know, they're not, you know, they're not, like I said, authentic, you know, and got yeah. the background. And They've heard Smells out. Like Teen Spirit, and that's about it, and yeah, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. But see, we went through five names before Nirvana. We, we were Skid Row, and then we was Pink Cap Chew, and we were Ted at Bread, and then we were Bliss, and then our fifth name was Nirvana. A lot of people don't know that, you know. Yeah, and not many people do know that. that. Yeah, and uh, how about right. how about the coming up with the name Nirvana? Was that Kurt or was that you guys just brainstorming? All yeah, it was all Kurt. Really, all Kurt. Yeah, everything was you know Kurt was. He just you know I don't look at him as as a big famous rock star. I look at him you know, as my friend. You know, he's kicking sure. with and hang out at his house and uh, <laughs> he was always he always had that a uh, bohemian kind of eccentric. Type because we practice like, for instance, we practice when we learn afford the barber. We play that song all for hours, all day long, just that one song. Really, you know, till we got it right. Yeah, so that's that was Kurt. He was when he was focused on something, boom, that was it. You know. Yeah, you can't get in his way when he's focused. That's awesome. All right. Uh, and sometimes he'd he'd uh, he'd go, he'd go here and here and give him drumsticks and. And I'd get up, and he'd sit down and kind of show me, this is how I want the drums to do. You know, this is how I want. And I'd go, right on, cool, you know? Sure, yeah, as long as you can show me clearly what you want, I can re- do right. that for you, right? You bet. That's really cool. Well, I guess that should be about it with the interview. Um, so the band is Screaming Sons of. Do you guys have a website? Yeah, see, it was, yeah we got to uh, go to Facebook on the Reverb Nation page. Okay. And you can listen to the four songs that we did at uh, Robert Lang Studios. Cool. And uh when is this gonna uh, 
when is this? It's just is this live right now, or is it going to be a rebroadcast? No, this is going to be uh, posted uh, after Thanksgiving. Actually, I've got an episode already in the can, and I promised I would post that first. But it'll be the first week of December. Right on. So, uh, cool. yeah, so that's ReverbNation.com slash Screaming Sons of, and uh, yeah, yeah got to just thank you from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I just I've loved the whole Seattle story ever since I was a little guy. So uh, this means right a ton, on, Andy. man. Right on. So yeah, cool. on behalf of uh, well, yeah, any any last words, Aaron? Uh, just uh, don't take any wooden nickels. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> awesome. Well, on behalf right, of it, uh, Aaron Burkhard, this is Andy Dare signing off for the Andy Dare Show. You can follow Andy on Twitter at Andy Dare. That's A N D Y D E R E R. You can like us on Facebook at facebookcom slash Show. You can check out the videos at youtube.com slash Andrew Martin Dare. And it all leads back to the Andy Show.com. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Andy Dare Show. <laughs>